Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is Brother Garfield, the Brother Garfield podcast. Today, I have my favorite female in the world coming on today. She is somebody who I've admired for years. I'm a major, major fan. I'm going to show you how much of a fan I am, family. I'm a major fan of this sister right here, right? Um, but let me, before she, before I bring her on, this sister called what we know as Dr. Oya Mayat. And I want to talk about some things that she has done in the past. And some things that um, we need to talk about as far as what she's doing. You have the Edamine production series, Meltrek. And I want you guys to go to the website. It's Edamine. Is it Edamine.com or EdamineProductions.com? She'll tell me. She'll correct me when she comes on. Because I want to give her all the things that she's doing. I know she's an educator. She's at the college. She's a doctor. She's everything you want to see in a black woman today that stands up for women 100%. So there's the Meltrek series number one, and then there's also part two, episode two, and there's also different coloring books, family. So she's not only, they're doing a lot of things. She and her, her children are putting out these series that, I mean, as a matter of fact, I got, um, I, I got to order, I ordered the, um, the one, the first one. I didn't order two yet, so I'm going to do that. I, I got to do that. I said, I'm going to do it with the scholars that came on this week. Dr. Um, Sheikh Ante Babu and, and Dr. Um, Francesca Stavra Kopulu. I'm going to order, I ordered their books already, so I have to order the sister. I got to keep up the rhythm here. I got to keep with the rhythm. So, um, and I'm encouraging everybody out there also to order these books because this is what you need to pass on to your children. It's a legacy. Meltrek is a legacy. A hundred years from now, we need to make sure Meltrek is preserved. So, how are we preserving it? Through DVD through books, and passing it on from one family to another. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you the, the woman of the day, the woman of the, <laughs> not even, I wouldn't even say the conscious community, one of the strongest women in the black community I know. When I mean strong, I mean black power strong. Not even black power strong, double black power strong. This sister right here, I've been knowing her for years. She's taught me a lot, and I think she brings something to the table, not only because this is Women's History Month, but she is a woman who has her PhD family. This is a doctor who took the time out to, to get her doctorate. And we gotta we gotta give gotta give her, her flowers, man. What they say in the hip hop community. Give them their flowers while they're alive. And this sister is great. How are you doing today, Dr. Maya? I'm doing fine, brother Garfield. How about yourself? I don't know, man. I, I think I gotta get spooky like Jabari right now. I think the stars <laughs> are aligned because last year I interviewed you on the 24th, and today look. Today normally is the day I shut down, and in August I shut down with my my father and mother's um and my sister's um anniversary of their death. Mm. My mother and father was died back to back years, family. Mm. So it's like 2000, 2001 was like the worst time period for me. My sister died two thousand six, mm. and um it's been a struggle with August. So August is like the worst, but on the twenty fourth of March is my mom's birthday, and last year Dr. Maya and I had an interview on this day and Dr. Maya would tell, correct me if I'm lying. Haven't we been trying to do this particular interview for weeks? For weeks. And, and, like, and, and, and for and, some and that's reason, what, we just keep something happening here, something happening here, something happening here. And, and then we're like, here today, like you said, on, on your mother's birthday. And you're right. You and I were coordinating this discussion since late February. Yep. Um, you had reached out. You said, hey, I want to bring you on for women. You know, Women's History Month is coming on. It's coming up. I want to bring you on. And I said, okay, brother Garfield, sure. And so, like you said, literally for the past four weeks, you and I have been going back and forth. We tried one Tuesday, couldn't connect. Another Thursday, couldn't connect. On a Wednesday, I forgot. And so mm -hmm. we've been literally missing each other. And then lo and behold, today was the day that we could could do it. And so, yep. like you said, and, and so, it, and it, you know, I, I always say, brother, brother Garfield, that, um, Nothing happens by chance in a universe ruled by divine order. Okay. Law and order. And so it happened for a reason, you know, that we were here again on, on March the 24th. I want to thank you for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. Um, Brother Garfield, you know, I've always loved you. You know, back in the day, you were beating up the Hebrews. Always. Nothing has changed. You, you know, you, your scholarship has gotten tighter. But yeah, you've you. always been giving the Hebrews the business since I've 
I've known you um, mm -hmm. and Thank I've just you. watched you grow. You know, I've really, I've watched you grow with the Dagger Squad. I love how you bring, and I don't know if you still bring her on, but Sister Monique, Sister Monica, you bring her on um, to do, to, to talk about economics, to talk about starting your 501c3s and investing and things of that nature. And so I've watched you grow over the years. You have a book you're getting ready to come out with. I think you said a, a second edition of that book, right? So you've mm -hmm. published a book. You have a podcast. So you've been doing a whole lot, um, Brother Garfield. And I just want to take this time to acknowledge and to salute you, brother, for all that you, Thank you uh, are doing. Thank you, Appreciate that. Yeah, and I also cool. want to say peace and love to the people in the chat. You know, I love all of you, including my haters, Brother Garfield. I have a lot of haters out here, but I, I love I all of them. Why would they hate you, though? Why would they hate Dr. Mayat, though? I don't know, Brother Garfield. I don't know. You, oh, you know, they all, the elders say that if you don't have haters, you're not doing something right, you know? And so yeah, yeah. I, I say, just, you I, ain't got no haters, you ain't nobody. That's right. Exactly. So I, I tell my folks, I, I love all of my people, including, including my haters, including my haters. All right. So today we're going to, um, I want to touch on mathematics a little bit from an African perspective, but before we get into that, can you explain to the audience, what does it mean to be African centered and also to be from an Afrocentric point of view? What, what does that mean to us? Oh man. Well, I, I probably won't articulate it as as well as um, one elder and one um, ancestor. I'm sitting here right now thinking about Kwame Nakoto. He mm -hmm. has a book um, uh, on African-centered education. And in that book, it's a beautiful description of, of what it means to be African-centered. Also, our elder, our esteemed elder, Baba Nwali Mubarudi, he has an entire book called Centered. And mm -hmm. in that book, he talks about what it means to be, you know, centered, what it means to be an African centered um, person. But but but, in you know, just a simple definition of what it means to be African centered is just to be operating uh, with an African worldview. Uh, many of us operate with a European worldview. And um, as Dr. Kobe Cambon, peace be upon his soul, he's an African centered psychologist who wrote a number of books. Um, one being uh, the African personality in America, another one being cultural misorientation. And he talks about the adverse effects of, of us operating uh, with a European worldview. He says that we develop a lot of psychopathologies as a result of being inculcated, constantly inculcated with uh, European content. And so to be African centered is to be, to be rooted in our history and our culture, uh, to be aware of our achievements, to be aware of our contributions to the advancement of humanity, which is which is, which is omitted in European uh, curriculums. And so, it I mean, that to me, like if I had to give a brief definition of what it means to be African centered, I would say to be operating with an African worldview, looking at the eyes through the lenses of our African ancestors and not our former slave masters and our oppressors. So viewing the world through our lenses, and, and, and being anchored in our history, our culture, and our achievements, operating with our morals and our values, not their morals and their values, but our morals and our values. And so that's how I would define uh, being African-centered. You know, in, in, in writing this book, right, Misconceptions and Misinformation by the Black Hebrew Israelites, and I've been reading so many books, and um, um, a sorry motive actually gave me this book. Right, it's traditional um, religion in West Africa. Very, very good book. And what I what I observe in my area of expertise is that we don't have anthropologists in that area, the ancient Near East. We don't have archaeologists in that area. Matter of fact, the guy that was my Hebrew teacher, his wife, actually a black woman, um, she's African American. She's actually the only archaeologist I've ever met. Mm. You know, she worked with some of the top guys, Finkelstein and Dever and all them guys. But she's in the background. She's the one picking up stones and doing real archaeology, not out front as the person that did the work. But, you know, you know, these guys always take all the credit for the, the quote unquote little people. So it's hard for me to study the biblical text from an African centered point of view. It's hard. Mm. Because I don't see the African in that study. We we normally say, 
okay, the ideas, these ideas were permeated in, in Africa, in either in Egypt or Ethiopia. We always go that route. I'm looking at Askak, which is um the guys, um, Reggie and um, Dr. Um, Malefi Asante and, um, you know, Asari Motep has spoken there a couple of times and all that stuff. They have it every year. And every time I see them talk about anything religious, it always seems they lean on Kemet as mm. one perspective. Like, you know what? Everything comes from Kemet, so the conversation is over. Not as far as a development, a transmission, a methodology. It just seems like we just rush to judgment and say, hey, I'm not saying nothing comes from Kemet. What I'm saying is, we don't have the studies to show how this person developed. It's like the, the book Stolen Legacy, right? We hear so many things positive and negative about that research, but it seems like we we read a book in the past and we just put paint a brush and just forget about scholarship. You know, it's like everything Greeks came up with has to come from Egypt because of what Stolen Legacy wrote or what Black Athena came up, came up with. So I, I'm trying to figure out how do we stay African centered without being overly biased in our research to make everything so African? No, so I, 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 brother Jabbar, that was a bunch of brother Garfield. I agree a hundred percent with you. There was a book. Um, oh my goodness. I'm looking at it. Oh, it was a book that Sinjeti. It was a book that Sinjeti had, um, had uh, recommended uh, to me. And it was a book about, um, it was a book about um, the African origins, like of mathematics. Okay. I'm not saying that that's the title. I'm just saying that it was a book, you know, that talked about, you know, the history of math in Africa, basically. Mm -hmm. And the author was arguing that the Fourier transform, and I'll explain what the Fourier transform is in a second, but the author who was a, uh, you know, I don't know if he was, you know, a continental African, a diaspora in African or whatever, but he was arguing that the Fourier transform came out of Africa. And so brother Garfield, I'm reading the book, right? And then you're talking to someone who teaches the Fourier transform. I've been teaching right. it for five years. Okay. Right, well, right. I'm looking for the book to give me the evidence, right? Like, and so he mentions, you know, African fractals. And if you look at, you know, Africans were well aware of frequency. If you look at how, uh, you know, our clothes, the patterns on our clothes, if you look at how we laid out our um, uh, uh, villages, if you look at, you know, and peace to brother smash Rockwell in the building, peace to you, King, peace, peace, peace. And so if you look at how we wear our hair, so the brother was arguing that African people developed the Fourier transform because of the way we wore our hair and the layout of our villages and the clothes we wore, like it, it made absolutely no sense. And for those of you who are familiar with the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform was a technique that was developed by a guy named John Baptiste Fourier. He was a uh, Egyptologist and he was a mathematician. And so he developed this method that allow that that allows us to view signals. And we know that signals is just a signal is just information conveyed over a period of time, but to view signals in uh, in the frequency domain. So typically when we analyze signals in, in engineering, we're looking at signals in the time domain, right? So we're looking at amplitude and we're looking at seconds, but his method allowed us to, allows us to view the signal in the frequency domain, okay? Where you're looking at frequency, right? Cycles per second as opposed to time. And so this author was arguing that our ancestors came up with the Fourier series, which is a simple integral, that we developed that. And then he, what he based it on, Brother Garfield, was, I, I don't want to say nonsense, like I don't want to do that to the brother, but it just wasn't a good argument, okay? And so I completely share your sentiments with um, just when, we, when we're analyzing things and we're looking at things, making sure that we remain, you know, uh, you know, uh, objective, right? Like not saying, well, I'm going to make it, you know, he, uh, Fourier, uh, John Baptiste Fourier was an Egyptologist. And so he developed the Fourier transform. So he, they must've got it from us, you know? And so we, we, we gotta, we gotta stop that nonsense. So I agree a hundred percent with you, brother Garfield. Do you, do you think, um, you know, 
the reason why I stay on my main course of, you know, lack of a better terminology as main course, because we're not talking about food now, <laughs> but as far as, as, as dealing with Hebrews and Judaism is, um, I, I, a couple of years ago, I said, I consider Judaism the mark of the beast. Mm. And the reason why I say that is because everybody wants to be a Jew. Everybody wants to be the chosen of God, directly or indirectly. So you have them popped up. There's a, there's now a theory that Ben Laden was related. The Afghanis were from the tribe of Judah, and Ben Laden was related to the tribe of. Ju Yo, I'm telling you, sis. I'm t sis. I've heard it's in my book. I've heard it all, and I'm I'm telling folks. Everybody wants to be chosen. Mm. Everybody wants to be chosen, and it's it's special. You it make you feel special. So now. What they're doing with Judaism now is, I, I don't know if a lot of people know this, they're expanding Judaism where they're converting people like Christianity. So all over Africa, people are converting to Judaism, all over New Zealand, Australia. Everybody wants to be a Jew. So I call it the mark of the beast because you're not going to succeed unless you're a Jew. Mm. And, and, and why I stay on it so much is because it seems like our worldview is 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 orchestrated or imbalanced because of being in a Judo Christian society. Absolutely. And even, if, and even if the Muslims had won that war in, in um Europe with the with the Christians and we were Muslims today, it still would have been guided by an Abrahamic faith. The same Judaism is still involved in Islam. So how do you feel investigating stuff with any any part of Africa? And then you're talking about the stuff that you talked about being invented <laughs> when you're talking about math, but the worldview is you're tight. You want to be African centered, but you're growing up in a Eurocentric Judo Christian society. How do you, how do you balance it? Because I, I, I want everything to be African. I do. I'm, subconsciously, I'm going to be honest. I want it to be African, but if it's not, oh, you will sell out. You know, where do we get this craziness from that? Everything has to be, African. No, it's it's and you're right. Everything doesn't have to be. Um, I mean, I re I respect uh, the the contributions, right? That 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 other other groups of people have made to the advancement of humanity. Um, what I dislike is when they omit the contributions that we have <laughs> we have made to the advancement of. Um, of humanity. And what I think brother Garfield is that they've done it so much that we're like, we got to tell our story. And then in telling our story, we want to disregard everyone else's because we've been so used to being, you know, left out, omitted. And so we're pushing, pushing, pushing for our story, for our accomplishments, for our history and things of that nature to be taught. And so like, but then it's to a point, brother Garfield, like you said, we want to blackenize everything. We want to Africanize everything. And that's not, um, I'm trying to look for the right word without being condescending. I don't want to say that's asinine. That was the first word, Brother Caulfield, that came to me. But that's not necessarily true. I'll say that. Everything isn't, you know, African. We don't, we live on this planet with other groups of people. You know, let, let's call it what it is. We live on this earth. We live on this planet with other groups of people. And just like we've made contributions to the advancement of humanity, uh, so have other groups of people. And it's nothing wrong with it, acknowledging that, you know, it's nothing wrong with saying, oh, you know, I learned this theory and I got this from so-and-so and so-and-so and -so may happen to be a European or I got it from so-and-so, so-and-so may happen to be, you know, an Asian. I mean, you, you get what I'm saying? It's nothing wrong with that. But I think we're at a point, Brother uh, brother Garfield, where we've been so damn damaged, Brother Garfield, where we just want to make everything. Everything is black, blackity black. Everything is, you get what I'm saying? And it's not necessary. That's not necessarily true. You know, and I'm African-centered to the bone. Uh, okay. but, I, but I have no problems, you know, uh, recognizing uh, the, the accomplishments and the contribution and even the history of other groups of people. How do you deal with um, the elders? Um, you discovered something was wrong by an elder. Like you discovered something wrong with, 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 with Dr. Ben. I, I don't, I, lately, I've been trying not to talk about any elders who have transitioned because I don't think they, they're not around one to answer for themselves. 
And two, you can't blame them because scholarship, as African-Americans or black folks in general, we got to applaud them for actually doing research, especially J.A. Rogers, who John Henry Clark really gave a big shout out to for inspiring him. Because if you look at what these guys are doing compared to what you're doing, Dr. Maya, and I think as a culture, we're actually intellectually lazy as researchers. Because mm. what we have today, they never had Google. They never had Google Scholar. They didn't have the um, scholarly articles. They never, All they had to do, and plus, even if they went to a library, they had to deal with racism and white supremacy. They might not be able to get access. J.A. Rodgers was born in Jamaica, but he was a light, light, light-skinned Jamaican. So he, he could pass as near white. Mm. So at the end of the day, J.A. Rogers knocked a lot of doors down and found out this person was black and so forth. People misrepresent his work and then said, oh, King James is black and all that craziness. Well, he never said that. But all these elders, we find something that's wrong. But what, what I'm challenging is not the elders. I'm challenging the sources that they use. Because in that time period, some of the sources were considered legitimate. You know, some of them were considered legitimate, even by European standards or white folks. And now today we might consider it pseudo. It's like in the first century, Josephus wrote that Hercules was a real guy. Tacitus wrote he was a real guy. Today, we consider Hercules fictional. So obviously something has happened in the last 2,000 years as far as methodology we look at it. So with the elders, it's the same thing. We may have read, read a source and say, for example, Dr. Ben read a source. Today, we, we're not looking at Dr. Ben now. We're looking at the source that Dr. Ben read. Would that be absolutely. the best way to look at it? No, absolutely. I don't I don't think it's wrong with that, but it just seems like in our community, it's like, oh no, no, don't correct the elders. Or don't correct, no, 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 don't say anything about the ancestors. Don't, you know, like you're being disrespectful simply because I, I literally when I corrected it was Sheik Antaj Joe. He 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 um he wrote something that was incorrect in his book, Civilization of Barbarism. Um, I believe it was in chapter six when he talked about the, the mathematical contributions of uh, ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet or something like that. But he he it was just a minor error and it could have been a typo. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But when I read it, I said, oh, wait a minute. Oh, he oh, he can't. Oh, no, this isn't true. He must have been this. And when I talked to the community about that, I mean, literally people, who does she think she is? Who did she think? Who does Dr. Ma'a think she is to correct, you know, the great shake anti-joke? And, and I'm thinking, is is the, he made an error? And 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 we treat our, our ancestors and our elders like they are infallible, right? Like none of none of none of us are infallible, none of us are beyond reproach. I mean, I'm pretty sure that I've made errors, and it's gonna be someone who comes behind me and say, Oh, well, when she developed this theory or these tools. Uh, she could have done it this way. And that's perfectly fine. And I, I just don't understand in our community, in our culture, it's like it's taboo, you know, to to correct elders and ancestors. It's like, you know, you can't correct them. And I think that as long as you you do it in a respectful way, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Let me give you an example. White folks, true story, in, in our electrical and computer engineering book or electric circus book, they mentioned Ben Franklin and they call Ben Franklin the father of electricity. electricity. Well, Ben Franklin thought that electricity was due solely to the flow of protons. They found out that it was due to the flow of electrons. Well, the electrons are flowing in one direction, the protons are flowing in another. Mm -hmm. But he's still regarded as the father of electricity. So even though they found out that he was he was wrong, you know, <laughs> you know people found out that he was wrong and they corrected him. Right. He's still honored and he's still respected, you know, amongst the European community. And so going back to our community, you know, we're still going to respect our elders and ancestors, even after we point out some of the flaws that they've made. And like you said, Brother Garfield, we can't knock them because they were operating with the with the information they had at their expense. I mean, at their, you know, that's that's what they had at that particular time. And so we can't knock them. Like you said, they didn't have the tools uh, that we had, you know, to, to search through data. And so, um, like I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with correcting our elders and ancestors as long as we do it in a respectful way. You know, uh, one thing I did not appreciate was there was this brother. Um, 
and I, brother Unk know who I'm talking about. He 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 kept saying we got to retire. They came before Columbus, and he was going at Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Terrible. And so I remember calling Brother Ankh up, and this was some years ago. When I called Brother Ankh up, I said, Brother, you know, I understand that, you know, you all may have found some flaws and they came before Columbus, but but going online and saying, we need to retire the book, you know, retire the book we don't need, and, and making it seem like he was a wacko, you know, that's just disrespectful. And then there's another platform called Taz Exclusives. I'm not sure if you heard about him. But he's been going at Dr. John Henry Clark. Y'all call this N-I-G-G-A, a scholar. I mean, just totally disrespectful. And he's been making video after video after video, uh, just disrespecting Dr. John Henry Clark, you wow. know. And so, like I said, I mean, if we find some some errors in their work, it's, I think there's nothing wrong with pointing them out and showing people where the error was and what it, you know, and correcting it, but we have to be respectful. That's all I ask. We got to be respectful. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get into um, some of your mathematics stuff that you got to show us today. And anyone who has a question, I'll put it on the screen and um, thumb up the video, like the video, and let's get it in. The floor is yours, sis. All right. And so I remember when, you, okay, so you wanted to talk like about. The video, like the video. And let's get it in. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so you can me... talk about um the, the 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 bones, or you could get into the other anything to do with mathematics. All right, we'll go ahead. If you want to talk about it while you're sharing it, let's get it in. You know. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen, brother Garfield. You got to click on it and add it to the to the. Hold on. Let me get you in right here. Get your full screen. All, all right. right, there you go. It's all yours. So can you see my presentation now? Yes, I can. All right. So, and then this comes out of the work of, um, shout out to uh, Brother Asar Imhotep um, in his book, Illusia, in his book, Illusia, Volume 2. Uh, he has a chapter where he talks about uh, the origins of, I believe the origins of STEM or the origins of mathematics. And he mentions a deity called uh, Shazet. And so this is a picture of Shazet carved on the back of the throne of the seated statue of Ramesses II in the Amun Temple at Luxor. And I had the honor of, of going to Luxor with uh, Anthony T. Browder this past uh, December. So anyway, so this is Sasset, uh sitting right here on the back of the throne of the seated statue of Ramesses, or some people say Ramesses II at, at Luxor. And it says it dates from around 2050 BCE. Now, Shaset was the complement of uh, some people say Jehudi, some people say Tahudi, some people says Doph. Okay, but he was the nature of writing, the nature of speech. And so she was the nature of wisdom, knowledge, and writing. And she was seen as a scribe and, and a record keeper. And so her name actually means, you know, she who scrivens, okay, she who is a scribe. And she's a, she's credited with the invention of writing alongside her compliment, uh, Tahudi or Jehudi or Doph. OK, she later became identified as the goddess of ag architecture, astronomy, astrology, building, mathematics and surveying. So STEM. So it says in today's terms, we would say that she was the personification of STEM, science, technology, engineering and math. The reason why I wanted to bring this to your attention or even to discuss this deity, Brother Garfield, is to show the people that we were so involved in STEM. STEM was deemed so important by us that we deified it, right? We deified it, literally, okay? And that's how important science, technology, engineering, and math was important to our African ancestors. And so throughout Kemet, you know, and this is in Kemet, but in Kemet, you had the, the oldest uh, math documents, um, the oldest documents of medicine. Um, you have, look at the, the beautiful architecture, right, that was created using the math and, and the science and, and the technology that they had at that particular time. But STEM was e extremely uh, important to our African ancestors. And some people don't think about this. Our African ancestors a lot of the herbalists, they are scientists too. They are scientists too. So a lot of those sisters 
who sat there and they looked at the different plants and they 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 analyzed the properties of the plants and, and, and figured out what plants are, are harmful, you know, what plants are good for us, uh, what plants can cure what disease. That is science. And so, you know, even the herbalists, the, the doctors, the healers in our community, they were the scientists, okay? The priests at the temples in Kemet, they were the scientists, all right. So I just want to talk about that. And then before I get into, um, you know, going back to the ancient times, I want to bring it up to play. I want to bring it up to today. It's Women's History Month. Right. And so mm -hmm. I want to highlight uh, black women in STEM, one of which is is Dr. Michelle A. Cornegay. All right. This is a sister who is an associate professor uh, and senior faculty researcher for the Center of Reverse Engineering and Assured Microelectronics in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Morgan State University. This is my mentor. Um, and she's also the reason why I pursued my doctorate in engineering. I, I mean, she was she's the first she's the first woman. She was the first woman to receive uh, her doctorate, her D.E., um, from from Morgan State uh, University School of Engineering. And she uh, inspired me to follow in her footsteps. In fact, on the day that she was hooded, which which was on March, I'm sorry, not March, but May the 18th, 2003, uh, on the day that she was hooded, I was receiving my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. And I remember she sat in front of me and I was extremely, extremely proud of just seeing her hooded, she had her big, you know, she had the real, we, we call it the choir robe um, uh, gown on. Typically when you when you get your, your BS degree, you graduate with those little paper thin gowns. But when you get your, you know, your master's and your, your PhD, they give you the big choir robe type of, <laughs> type of uh, gowns. And so she had her, you know, she had on her garments and I sat there just so uh, inspired. I said, wow, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. And so I want to first highlight and salute Dr. Michelle uh, A. Cornegay. Uh, I also want to highlight Dorothy Johnson uh, Vaughn. Okay, this was a sister who uh, she was born in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and then she moved to West Virginia with her family. Uh, she graduated with her bachelor's in mathematics from Wilberforce University uh, in Ohio. She worked as a math teacher for 14 years. And, and this was the sister who was the, 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 the acting supervisor of what they called the West Area Computers, which was the first African-American woman. I'm sorry. She was the first African-American woman to supervise a group of staff at that center. So she was working, you know, for NASA, uh, formerly known as, you know, the National Advisory Committee of Aeronomics. And so. She was the supervisor of that department. They called it the Department of Human Computers, which was really a department of black women, black mathematicians who were responsible for, for the calculations. And I know some of you pseudos will say, oh, we never made it to the moon. That never happened when they, with the, with the astronaut uh, circulating around the earth. And he never, no one ever did that. No one. Well, when you say foolishness like that, you're literally discounting the work of your ancestors because it was black women. I want to say this again. It was black women who made it possible for them to do those things. OK. And so even when they began to usher in computers, right, IBM uh, created a computer with, that had a program and language Fortran. When they began to usher in the computers, it was no need for these no need for these human computers anymore, right? And so when they said, okay, we're going to do away with the, this, this department, what this sister did was she went and taught herself the program and language Fortran and then taught it to those black women. So, and they learned how to program the computers that were being developed by uh, IBM. All right, so I want to salute Sister Dorothy Johnson. Also would like to salute Sister Mary Jackson. Sister Mary Jackson uh, was, uh, she earned her, she's from uh, Hampton, Virginia. She earned a BS in mathematics and physical science from, uh, Hampton university. And some people will say that's the original HU and not Howard, <laughs> but, uh, she also worked, uh, at, uh, the national advisory committee for aeronautics. Okay. Which was again, is 
now it's in as now it's NASA. Okay. And she started as a research mathematician or what they would call a computer. She was a human computer. And so she became their first NASA's first African American uh, female engineer. And uh, she became an aeronautical engineer in 1958. So I want to salute Sister Mary Jackson. I also would like to salute uh, Sister Catherine Johnson, who just became uh, you know, an ancestor on February the 24th, 2020. Um, this sister also you know, worked at uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronomics. And uh, it says she was reassigned to their guidance and control division at Langley's Flight Research Division. And she completed or computed the calculations necessary for several space missions, including the 1969 moon landing. And this is for those pseudos who say that we've never landed on the moon. It was actually a black woman and her calculations that made this possible. And so I want to acknowledge her. And so these women that I'm talking about, their lives were uh, told in the movie uh, Hidden Figures. And so I remember, Brother Garfield, when this movie came out, oh, my goodness, I was extremely, extremely um, me and other and other female engineers and mathematicians and scientists that I'm connected to. We loved Hidden Figures because it showed that, yes, black women are scientists, too. Black women are mathematicians, too. Black women are engineers, too, because those fields are typically, you know, they're male dominated fields. And so when this movie came out, I mean, I'm telling you, we were all texting each other and, you know, and calling each other because we were like, yes, yes, yes. You know, finally, you know, it's depicting black women as as mathematicians, as scientists and as engineers. And so their lives were told in this movie. And this is one of my favorite movies. Um, I would like to acknowledge and acknowledge uh, Dorothy Lavinia Brown. Um, this was a sister who became, you know, the first African-American female surgeon. OK, it says that she was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and lived in an orphanage until she was 12. And it says while she was in the orphanage, you know, she had an experience that sparked her interest in the field of medicine. OK, and so shout out to this sister right here, Sister Dorothy. Uh, sister Gladys Mae West. Um, this was a sister whose whose work, whose mathematics brought about the invention of GPS. So I know a lot of us will sit here and use Google Maps. And before Google Maps, we were using MapQuest. Well, it was the mathematics of a black woman that enabled this technology to be produced. OK, so salute to Sister Gladys Mae West. Of course, we have to acknowledge Sister Mae Jemison. Uh, who's still with us, who's still among us. This was a sister uh, who became the first black woman to travel into space when she served as, when she served on the mission specialist or as a mission specialist aboard the space shuttle Endeavor. So, you know, again, when we say things like, oh, they never been to the moon, they never been in outer space, they never did this. You're literally discounting the, uh, the accomplishments of, of black women who have been a part of these things. I also want to acknowledge uh, Sister Valerie A. L. Thompson, Thomas. Uh, her alma mater was Morgan State University. Okay. And this sister invented what's called the illusion transmitter, which is a device that used concave mirrors to project 3D optical illusion. So this is a bad sister who's still among us. And in fact, Brother Garfield, I'm going to reach out to her to see if she can come on my platform to talk about uh, what she created. Uh, last but not least, Brother Garfield, and some, some of the anti-vaxxers may be upset when I show Sister Kizmikia, Sister Kizzy. This was a sister uh, who was born in North Carolina, who received her BS in biological sciences and uh, sociology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, which is about 30 minutes from where I live. And uh, she received a PhD in microbiology and immunology at, from the University of um, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And it says in October of 2014, she became a research fellow working as a viral immunologist at the NIS, I'm uh, sorry, not NIS, but at the National Institute of Health, where she began heading the government search for a vaccine to end the coronavirus outbreak. 
All right. And so, Brother Garfield, I know I've been going, going, going. Did you want to chime in at any point or you want me to keep on flowing? Keep on flowing, man. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Man. Here we go. All right. My so here we go. Coming so, up. Here we go. Yep. Absolutely. And so we have a, I just wanted to highlight those women uh, for, for uh, Women's History Month. Um, in, in the show that we we come from, uh, now I'm going to show that we come from a long legacy of you know of mathematics in 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 science and and brother Garfield is is I just want to say this it's also important to highlight women doing you know uh, just having Women's History Month is important because living in this society and and being in male dominated fields a lot of the contributions that women make seem to be overshadowed right it, it, so. People, so for example, we'll talk about Dr. King's um, and, and what he did, Dr. Martin Luther King. We'll talk about him, but we won't talk about uh, Coretta Scott King, right? Like what she's done, okay? We, we have a national holiday, right, for Dr. King because of Coretta Scott King. So we'll talk about Dr. King, but we won't talk about Coretta. We'll talk about Malcolm X, but we won't talk about Dr. Betty Shabazz, Shabazz right? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the Honorable Marcus Garvey, but you won't talk about Henrietta Henrietta Vinton Davis, who held it down when Garvey was in jail. Yeah. And even mm -hmm. after they deported him, she went and stayed with him. We'll talk about these men, but yep. we won't highlight the women. We'll talk about the Black Panther Party and Huey P. Newton. And um, what's this? Oh, goodness. I'm sitting here thinking about Bobby it. Seale, Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale. Bobby, Bobby Seale. Seale. Thank you. We'll talk about Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, but we won't have conversations about Asada Shakur, right? Angela Davis and, you know, and uh, Catherine. Um, Cleaver, Cleaver, and and all and, and a, a number of other you know black women who held down the Panther Party and even other you know black liberation movements. Even with us, we talk about Dr. Melana Karenga, but we won't talk about those women in us, right? That that made it happen. So anyway, I think it's just a, 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 important for us to take some time to you know set aside some time to highlight the um, the the contributions of of women. So anyway. Um, just, I just wanted to show you all the Lombombo bone, you know, I'm just moving into how we, um, come from a long legacy of, of mathematics and, and science and, and, and technology and engineering. Okay. So the Lombombo bone, which is, uh, is really a counting stick, right? Like if I look at the description of it, it says the oldest mathematical instrument is a tally stick. It was, um, it's literally, you know, you see these notches on the, the fibula of a baboon. OK, and it's 29 notches on on this fibula. And so they say that this was, a, you know, it could be a measuring stick, maybe a lunar phase counter. You know, so people have their ideas or their theories on what it was, but they, they think it's a tally stick. And uh, before we went live, I remember, Brother Garfield, you asked me, you said, well, could this have been the beginning of, you know, the creation of a lunar calendar. And I'm like, well, yeah, it, it could be, right? Like, if you think about it, right? Like, that's a, a possibility that I wouldn't rule out, you know, given that it did have 29 notches on it. So it may have been someone counting, right? Like counting the days, you know, we, I don't, I don't know. All right. And so anyway, it, it is dated to about 35,000 uh, BC. It was discovered in the 1970s by a researcher named Peter Beaumont. And it was found near the border cave uh, in the Lombombo Mountains. That's why they call it the Lombombo Bones uh, between South Africa and Swaziland, okay? And so this particular site was first excavated in the 1930s and the 1940s, and they found a whole lot of stuff. You know, they found that, you know, there was a cave that was being uh, continuously occupied, you know, for over 120,000 years. Um, that's why when, when, when we say, White folks are cave people. They're cave people. I'm like, uh, do you understand that it was the ancestors, our ancestors who migrated south and stayed stayed in caves, which is the reason why we're here today, right, Brother Golf? I know Brother Onk talks a lot about that and how there was this ice age or ice, you know, this ice storm that came through and it sucked up all of the waters and people migrated south. Well, when we migrated south, we stayed in caves, <laughs> right? So wow. and in, and in, and in these caves, you find the, the oldest evidence of, of symbolic thought. So if you give up the caves, you give up the oldest evidence of symbolic thought, the oldest evidence of art. <laughs> OK, so our ancestors were in, living in caves, too. Right. So anyway, um, it, it, when they excavated 
uh, the the border cave, found that it was occupied for over 120,000 years. They found human bone fragments. They found, you know, 69,000 artifacts and they found, you know, 43 mammal species. OK. And so the, the most interesting find, in my opinion, was this Lombombo bone. And then you have the Ashango bone that was uh, that's being housed at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. This bone is about 20 or 20,000 years old. And, you know, it was discovered by John D. And I probably butcher his name, Henseling, in the 1950s. Uh, again, it's 20,000 years old. Uh, they say that it has 168 parallel marks positioned in groups distributed on three sides. Now, they believe, a lot of people postulate, well, John postulate, that the groups represented numbers, right? And so if you look in the center of the bone, you see three, six, four, eight, 10, and five. And so you see doubles, right? Except the last two values, five and seven, but more than likely you see doubles, okay? If you look at the, the right side, it says that the right side, you know, could be linked to, you know, base 10, right? Or if you look at the left side, it may be showing prime numbers, right? And the prime number is just a number that's divisible by itself in one. So they're saying that the left column may have shown, you know, prime numbers. All right. But other researchers are saying that it may be like a sliding scale involving three and four base numbers, uh, and, or that it may be just a, a, a system number notation related to the lunar calendar, right? And so anyway, the Lombombo bone was found in the Great Lakes region, right in Lake Edward. OK, and so it's the East African Rift System Western Branch, uh, which is the 15th largest lake in Africa. And it flows, it says north northwardly flow. So it's the source of the White Nile. So we know that the Nile River uh, is consists of the blue and the White Nile. And so they're saying that this lake, Lake Edward, is a source of the White Nile. All right. And so this area that we're talking about, Lake Edward, it was excavated in 1935, 1950, 1959. And uh, it revealed they found bones of Homo sapiens sapiens. They found harpoons, which are like the fishing hooks, different types of ha um, har harpoons. And they, all fa they also found corks tools. All right. And so that is where they found the Lombardo bone. Want to get into some of the documents that we found in Kemet. Oh, in this presentation, I may not have the documents. Oh, I did have the documents. All right. So we have, I'm looking for the Rhine's mathematical document. That's the first one I wanted to show you. Yeah, yeah. We call it the Rhine's papyrus or, you know, we like to call it the papyrus uh, of the scribe of Amos. That's what he, when he signed his name, he signed it the scribe of Amos. So the Rise Papyrus is, is being housed in the British Museum. And family, I cannot wait to take a trip to go to the British Museum. I think I may spend like the entire- I went, I went there last year and I have videos and everything. I was actually, I made a lecture to some, this guy had known me from YouTube and mm -hmm. he stopped me in the museum and I was lecturing his daughters the importance of history. I got to put that video up too. Yeah, I was God, in the museum. I did a whole video. I called Sean because I needed to translate something, and he ain't he ain't if you got the phone. And I told him I'm not calling him no more. I <laughs> call him call him live. Say translate this for me live, bro. And um, <laughs> it was crazy. We did a whole video shoot and everything. I gotta put it. I gotta put up everything one day. I just haven't had the time. Brother yeah, Garfield, tell, I know you got lost in the museum. Like I know you were what? just taking back. I went through the whole Kemet. Then I had to go to the whole Assyria part. Then I went to the whole Mesopotamia part, Sumer. I went through every I went through everywhere, man. Everywhere. Went through the Greek period, the Roman period, the Persian period, oh. the Syrian period. The um the, <laughs> I went through all the periods and I was videotaping the whole time. They say you can't videotape, but they can't tell me not to. I'm going here to see my ancestors, man. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And I'm glad you videotaped it. I hope that you do put it out there. And I gotta I do have to admit that I'm super jealous of uh <laughs> oh, I went to the library, I got signed up because the guy from um England, black family. He, 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 you probably know him, but you probably don't know that you know him. You know, he probably follow your channel and everything. And he mm -hmm. was my escort to the whole trip. And he set up all the book signing. That's where I saw all your works, your, your, your documentaries in stores. And I'm like, oh, look at Dr. Mayad all the way in the UK. 
So oh wow, beautiful. Yeah, I went to a store. There was there's this big center that they have in Birmingham, um, UK, and they had a um, bookstore beside it. This big facility, and your book was in that facility. The lady took some of my books to sell also. Oh, beautiful, brother! Yep. Did you, brother Garfield? Why did you take a picture? Did you take a picture of that? You know what? I think I did. I got to go through my phone because my phone has the dates when I went and everything. So I could just go back and check. And then on top of it, I went to, um, I, I joined the library. So now I could log in from here and, and find out different stuff in the archive because, you know, I'm doing the whole King James thing. So mm-hmm. um, I'm supposed to do a debate in the UK with Brother Daniela from Lands of Israel on King James and all that stuff. But I found some images. I went to the National Archives, sis. And I saw images of King James I have never seen in my life. Uh, Primary God, sources in his lifetime. So when I'm done with, with Daniela, they can't say he's black anymore. They can't. They Trust me, they can't. Mm. They can't say he's black. And at his funeral, they said he was white. Mm. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't go around. And, and by the way, too, when we look at in, in, in America, when we say somebody's dark and swarthy, and we say that the person is black because they say that the reason why they use those words for white people is because of the British. The British thought they were the superior white race. Mm. So everybody else who is a little bit darker than dark whites or brunette white, as they call it, would be mm. swarthy. They call Al Capone in Chicago dark and swarthy. And, you know, Al Capone was a straight up white man. Right. But straight up. Him- they call him dark and swarthy. They call the Italian mafia people dark and swarthy. And they mm. were white as snow. You know, but hey, I, I mean, you, you all, y'all going to see. When me and him do the debate, y'all going to see. I'm going to put the, the primaries out. I was at the National Archives and the white guy was there at the, at the counter. And mm. he said, look at this. Check this book out. This will tell you a lot of the stuff. And he showed me a book that they wrote at the National Archives with all the images of King James and how he looked at what time period when he was a baby, when he grew up, and da 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 I'm like, and I'm looking at it, I'm taking pictures, and I'm like, can I get this book? I went by the museum. No, I went by the, the library, no, the museum. They have a bookstore right beside the museum. Mm-hmm. And that book, I had every book you want to know about what's in the museum. And that King James book, I bought it immediately. I bought the King Charles book. I went to another museum. The one where the queen live at when she's not at Buckingham Palace. I went to that museum, bought a book over there with King Charles with all the primaries. So <laughs> trust me, I got all the search on them, them kings. So if people want to go white, I got daggers. all the primaries. Look, daggers, all primaries. daggers. That's all I keep hearing is daggers, daggers, <laughs> daggers. <laughs> yep. Daggers. But I hope that, that that's really on my bucket list to go over to the British Museum and just... Like I, like I said, spend a few weeks over there and just get lost in the museum. You know what I mean, Brother Garfield? And like you say, and just gather mm-hmm. data, you know, because like, and, I, and I'm with you, I'm taking pictures and I'm video recording. All right. Yeah. Because like you said, this is really our stuff. A lot of stolen, even, even, a lot even, of stolen even, artifacts. Yeah. In the museum, they say that you can't take images of, um, a matter of fact, let me look through this right now. See if I find where, when I went to that spot and see if I could give you a picture of that right now. And the send it to your inbox. I have this phone and I have my other phone. So one of these phones must have those pictures. Mm-hmm. Uh, here we go. This is when I was at a spot. Let me see. Yeah, send it to me. I think I just, I think you just sent it. Hold on. Let me look. No, no, no I didn't send it yet. No, you didn't send it to somebody else trying to get at me. Hold on. No, you didn't send it. But I'm going to send you this image and you can't put this image up. I'm going to tell you right but now. I can't? You can't. Don't put it up yet. I'm okay, I won't. I won't. Right this is um, this is King James and his son. Just look at it. That's his son at Wales, and that's a primary image right there. I just sent it to your inbox. Oh, I just oh daggers. <laughs> dagger. This I'm is a dagger. That. Yep, I've only shown you and Rob on that image. I'm I'm killing it. I'm a, I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna kill that whole thing. You oh, see, yeah. you got to find images that were authorized, and the images that they show is actually not by painters, it's by engravers, people that never met King James. So mm. all these you have, I mean, the whole King James thing is just, is just flawed. The methodology is just flawed, totally, totally. Mm. And they don't yeah, understand the image it's, now. It's, it's over. <laughs> I'm looking at the image now. You show that, it's over, Brother Garfield. It's over. 
Yep, and that's him and his son. Yep, primary source. Yeah. 1605, 1605, crowning his son the King of Wales. Yep. Oh yeah, as soon as you yeah, as soon as you show, as soon as you show this, it's over. I, it's, it's not going to be a debate. I don't even. <laughs> when, when you show this image, it's going to end the debate. That that's it's yeah. not even going to be a debate after you show this image. So I, I don't even know how he's going to recover. Um, after you, after you show, uh, this image. But let me. And, I'm almost finished up. And I also, one more thing too. When you huh? go to the National Archives, you got to go there. The National Archive. A, you know the conspiracy people always say they got a secret room. They really have a secret room. So they have a room where you have to book and go there, and they have to actually bring the stuff to you and put it in a in a in a in a draw and give you permission to go in the draw. Mm. What I did was I actually went down there, went in the draw, saw a primary image, a drawing of King James. And when you, this is another dagger, by the way, too. I videotaped it so nobody can't say I made it up. And when you see this image and this video, it, the game is over. It, 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 you know what I'm saying? It, it's it's rap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you say go to the National Archives as well as the British Museum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but the, you got the British Library, the British Museum. And um, the only place I didn't regret going that I didn't get to go was the University of College of London. They have a library because that's where um, Michael Hammer and David Rowe and all the racists, Michael Rice, they went to that school. Um, Petrie's guy that used to fund him was attached to that school. So it's a really a racist school, but they got a lot of top line, top notch information there. University of College of London. Mm. Mm. Well, like I said, I hope to be one in a number, one in a number soon. And I want to spend, you know, I want to spend some time over there. Like you said, I wanted to just be one day. I'm at the British Museum the next day. I really want to spend, you know, I want to take my time with this because it's a lot of information, um, yep. you know, in these in these institutions. So I really want to lay eyes on the Ryan Papyrus if I'm able to. But um, the Ryan Papyrus, again, it was produced by a scribe, almost, is written in hieratic. And it's to the second intermediate period, approximately 1550 BC. Now, this is the meat and potatoes, okay? The Ryan Papyrus contains 84 tables of division, multiplication, the handling of fractions, and geometry, including volumes and areas. So a lot of these things, these concepts that our that our children learn, you know, in elementary and in middle school. A lot of the our ancestors were doing that thousands of years ago, Brother Garfield. And so we we had, you know, one of the oldest mathematical documents, right? Look at the papyrus of, of Moscow, the Moscow papyrus. It's also written in hieratic and is dated to the Middle Kingdom, approximately 1850 BCE. This contains 25 problems, mostly in geometry. So when you have people that say, oh, we didn't build the pyramids, it was aliens and all this other crap. I'm like, do you know that we had the technology and the know-how to build it? We, 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 we understood the math. We understood the science. It's right here. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe it's either in the Moscow or the Rhine's Papyrus where there's a problem where they're solving the volume of a pyramid. I, like I said, I don't know whether it's the Moscow or the Rhines, but it's in one of these papyruses that literally they they are solving, trying to find the, the volume and the, the area of a, of a pyramid. And so, yes, we did build the pyramids, and it kills me when people say that we don't. And let me show you what it's, what it's a dagger when it, when it comes to people who say we didn't build the pyramids, uh, Brother Garfield. Anyone can pull this pit this this paper. It's called the Exley B. Cox Jr. Expedition Excavation at Midem, right? So at the excavation at Midem. They found that when they analyzed the pyramids, they literally saw the names of the pyramid builders. The pyramid builders worked in gangs. And so on the stones, they found the names of the pyramid builders written in hieroglyphs. I'm going to say that again, Brother Garfield. Mm -hmm. Those of the people who believe that aliens built the pyramids, pull this paper right here, the excavations at Midem, or maybe Maidem, I may be butchering it because of my Baltimore accent, but pull the picture, pull this uh, 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 publication nonetheless, or has been published in the Museum Journal, volume 22, pages 5 through 85. 
if you read the excavation, you'll find that when they analyzed the pyramids and they looked at the daggone bricks, they saw the names of the pyramid builders. Okay. They worked in gangs. And so you see the names of the gangs and I don't know, maybe each gang had to produce, you know, a certain amount of bricks. You know, I don't know, you know, maybe that was how they tracked the amount of work that the gangs did, but nonetheless, the, 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 <laughs> the gay, the gangs wrote their names. They, they wrote it in hieroglyphs. And not only did they write it in hieroglyphs, they wrote it in red okra. And anyone that knows about red okra, it's a red pigment, right? That was first used in Pinnacle Point, which is in South Africa. So unless the aliens, brother, uh, I said brother, unless the uh, the aliens, brother Garfield, got a hold of some red okra and they they've already had that tradition and they already knew the glyphs. I mean, I don't know, but I think that's a dag in itself <laughs> that, we, that we have the names that we have the gang names. Okay, stemming from the fourth dynasty stones at Midam. Okay, so that's a dagger in itself. So we built the pyramids. People can go ahead with that nonsense about the aliens and about the white Jews building it. They can go ahead with that mess. All right, and I'm trying to think, is there anything else I want to show the people? Okay, it was one more papyrus. We call it the Berlin Papyrus 6619. And this is a papyrus. This is a papyrus um, that has, it says, readable fragments produced in the 1900s. Uh, it was produced around the Middle Kingdom, written in hieratic. And the types of problems, uh, math problems that they find in this papyrus is the square numbers, uh, which is evidence of the knowledge of, of the properties of the Pythagorean triplets. OK, so our children learned that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. They learned that that was developed uh, or introduced by Pythagoras mm, when really you have a, a papyrus that's dated back, you know, to the Middle Kingdom that has, you know, squared numbers and, and evidence that we knew the properties of Pythagorean triplets prior to, you know, Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theorem being created, okay? In this particular papyrus, they also show you how to solve a system of two equations. And that's something that we do in algebra, right? Algebra one and two, where you where we solve, you know, simultaneous equations or a system of uh, equations. So this is evidence that our ancestors were even doing algebra one and algebra two, thousands of years ago. So that concludes, let me get rid of this. That concludes my presentation, uh, Brother Garfield. And I appreciate you, you know, allowing me to come on your platform to share this information with your viewers. All right. Um, for anyone who has a question, now is your time. Let's get it. Somebody asked earlier, do you think Brother Garfield is pseudo? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think Brother Garfield is pseudo. Oh man! <laughs> um, and someone said, "What lion's time?" He said that sounded very Baltimore. -y. Yeah, lions <laughs> and, and what and what lions? What's, what's your point? Did you understand the information? <laughs> did you get it? Sister got some knowledge. Salute. All yeah, right. did you get it? You know, people be saying stuff. I look at you know posts sometimes. Brother Garfield and the comments that people make, and they'll point out the most minute thing. And I'm like, did you kept? Did you get the message, brother? Did you did you understand the information? You know, they you know they they kill me with that foolishness. All right, nobody want to ask no question. Oh, Essie, Essie 44 said he was just joking. Okay, Essie, I'm about to look. I'm about to go in, Essie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much, Sister Tamika, Sister Juju, the Queens in the building. Brother yeah, Zane. The website is um, edamineproductions.com. It's in the chat. Sister Juju put it in. Um, Ao Hashem, thank you for the um, the contribution. Let me see who else made a contribution. Sister Anusha, thank you. I think they got a four four girl group now that has a yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, we nope. need to big that up. You know what I'm saying? I need Those to. Those um, are my girls right there. And why, brother Pierre Black? He said we be trolling you, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> they did he ain't lying. I look at the chat like, why they say what are they doing? So he eats, uh, I guess that's trolling. That's the thing that people do. But yeah, family, please support um the Meltrek project. Thank you so much, Brother Garfield, for talking about um the Meltrek project. We're currently working on Meltrek episode three, um, exploring the Maafa, the arrival of the Portuguese. You still need my accent, man. You still need my Jamaican accent. You know it's what still, happened? Yes, I say you still need my Jamaican accent. Yes. Yes, you need to come down to Baltimore because we're recording the voiceover. I'm gonna drive down there. Let's tell me when I drive down. 
Okay, yeah, we need you. And we'll put you up, Brother Garfield. You don't got to worry about anything. You come down, you want to stay a day or so, we'll put you up and take care of your gas, take care of your toes. So we'll make sure we we pull out the red carpet for you when you when you come down. But um, but yeah, we're working on Meltrek episode three. We have to we have to record three people. Uh, that is the Griot, which is you. Um, one of the little kids, a middle school child, Bunchy, and we had to record, record the narrator. I was thinking about using a Saw Amos Tep's um, voice for the narrator because uh, the narrator because he's his voice is so oh, deep. Got, so I was thinking about using dude, him. For that. We got this dude named um, oh man, he's supposed to do the audio version of my book. I forgot his name. He got a Grammy Award too. But his voice is really deep. His voice is nice, perfect. Yes. Yeah, I need one of those. I'm looking for those one of those James Earl Joneses. Barry White type uh, stuff. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hit up Kyle. <laughs> Sheffrin said, please don't come to Baltimore Garfield. Shake your mind. <laughs> Sheffrin, funny. But look, we um so we're working on Mel Trek episode three, exploring the Maafa, where we're gonna be talking about, you know, slavery, the system of slavery, uh, how it got started, uh, why it got started, and and the amount of wealth that was created. From this system, um, we're going to talk about, you know, of course, you know, we got to talk about resistance as well. And we're going to be, you know, so I don't want our children to think, oh, we just ran away from. We'll be talking about the Maroons. We'll be highlighting the Maroon communities. We'll be talking about, you know, all of the ancestors who fought back. Um, and so anyway, it's going to be a beautiful um it's actually three episodes. So it's exploring the Ma'afa part one. It'll be a part two and part three. OK, so sort of like a mini series where we um, explore uh, the Ma'afa. And so we're working on that. Uh, we also launched a program. I'm not sure brother Ankh talked to you about it, but it's a program called Conscious Ingenuity. The website will be live on, on Friday, but we launched this program in several schools in Baltimore city. It's a school, it's a program that utilizes steam to build character, confidence, and capabilities. We're in several schools in Baltimore city, and we're getting ready to offer a virtual version of the program so that children around the world will have access to conscious ingenuity. All right. And so I need to come back on brother Garfield at some point to give people that information so that people can get their children enrolled in this STEAM program. Uh -huh. did, you add, did you add the Hanseatic League to your to your thing about the slave trade? Because you know the slave trade wouldn't have happened if that didn't get cut off, Hanseatic League. The Hanseatic no, League didn't, is, didn't. is in Northern Europe. And what happened is that once the, the Ottoman Empire got involved and cut off them, the Jews, the, the Portuguese had to find other ways to make money. So that's when they started exploring. No, you got to put me on with that source. Yeah, is it, is it in your book? It's going to be my part two, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to put me so on. We have, to, we have to establish why the slave trade happened and it ain't had nothing to do with no religion. No, so, no, no. It didn't have anything you know to do with religion. So, yeah, yeah, but we mentioned how the when the Portuguese first came in, they came in through Quetta, then they made their way into what Morocco, then Mauritania, then they got around Cape Bojador and made it into the Guinea, and then they started kidnapping people. And so we talk about it from there, but we didn't go all the way back to what you're talking about. Um, we oh, didn't. We got a question for you. Here. Got a question for you. Got a question for you. Why do you think math? Hold on, let me put it on the screen. Why do you think math so hard for most of us, U.S., most of us to understand and how can we overcome? Great question. That's a I great mean, question. Before you uh, answer that, you. when I first came to this country and I went to college in Queens, this sister I was dating said to me, it's a conspiracy why we don't learn, we don't know math. There's some conspiracy. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I just got off the boat. But maybe you can help me to understand why she said that too. <laughs> No, I think I think that uh, Sister Regina's question is really. I think it's 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 um, it's hard because of the way that it's taught. That's what I think. And uh, there's a brother. I don't know if you heard of Akil uh, Parker. He has a um, a program called I think it's All This Math, and he makes math really really easy for children to understand. And so again, I think Sister Regina to answer your question. I think that it's because of the way that is taught. And to overcome this, we have to invest in people, in tools that will better facilitate the learning of mathematics. You get what I'm saying, Sister Sister Regina? And so, you know, we got to tap into people like, you know, um, Akil Parker. Uh, you have, um, oh my goodness, Gifted and Lit. They have a math program, okay? 
where they use culturally responsive strategies to teach math and science to our babies. And so, you know, we had to really, um, you know, in order to overcome this, invest in tools that would, again, like I stated previously, better facilitate the learning of math. Uh, me personally, I love is a tool called Alex that I adore. A L E K S, Alex, and it's a it's a it's a tool that will assess what you know, and and based on what you know, it creates like a path for you to follow in order to learn certain topics, and so. This 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 software or this system is is based on machine learning. So it's kind of like it's, it tailors your learning experience, okay, to what you know and what you don't know. And so I love that tool, Alex. So again, it's just you know investing in tools that will help us um, learn learn math. So Peter Black said, "What's my take on the opinion of Queen and Zanga?" Yeah, I, I know Peter Black people were going at Queen and Zynga. I had brought Brother Onk on and we addressed this actually, but people were saying she, and I know Chef, Ra, Chef is probably boiling right now in, in, in the chat, but we talked about uh, Queen and Zynga and, and people say, oh, she participated, you know, in the slave trade and she did this and she did that. And, and what I'll say, and I, I said this on the show publicly when they first started going at Sister uh, Queen and Zynga, I'll say that we have to be careful about judging uh, the actions of our ancestors uh, through 21st century lenses. So we'll sit back, Brother Garfield, and say, so-and-so, I mean, look at what they did. Integration was wrong. Look at what they did, you know, and they shouldn't have did, and they shouldn't have did, and they should have knew, and they should have knew. But we have to understand that these people were products of the era. They were products of the era. They were products of their culture, products of what was going on within the system. And, and so, you know, I say all that to say, you know, I don't want to say she did what she had to do, but I mean, that's kind of words that were coming, <laughs> coming to my mind. So Tom yeah. Ford says, when in hold on, hold on, sis. Hold on, sis. Before you read that question, let me say this. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the, the Hebrew Israelites um, always claim why that is actually Judah. And for those who don't know, the most slaves came from that port, 1.85 million. Almost 2 million came from that port of Wida. And it's not the wider people that's being enslaved. It's mm. other tribal people capturing people in the Alada community, people in Dahomey, people in the Oya, Oya Kingdom, the Yoruba people. So these are tribal wars. And now today in the 21st century lens, we're looking at it as countries. That's where you're even off the bat. You're wrong totally. You're not even looking at it correctly. Tribal wars is not, there is no geographic carved out Africa during the slave trade. These were different tribes and different areas who ruled over different areas. And they had wars with their neighbors and they had prisons of wars. And they felt, hey, the best way for me sometimes to get guns is to basically pass on these prisons of wars. So that's what basically what happened. You know, did people purposely say, hey, I'm going to capture my people? Yes, you did have some African tribes selling their own people at times in a very, it's a very much, it's a little less than 0.1% did that. It's not, not no you know, predominant all over Africa stuff, but most of the people that came over were prisoners of war. It's, it's a fact. It's a fact. So for us to say Africans sold Africans, no, you're actually incorrect. Tribal men had wars and had prisoners of wars and sold them. It was just a part of the culture. Exactly. And then can we can we also add, Brother Garfield, that they didn't have it was no concept of all of us are Africans and we're selling other Africans exactly. into slavery. It wasn't it wasn't even a concept of that. Right. You know, you know, I asked a question in my back chat today. I said, would you guys consider Algeria Africa? Because I've never heard somebody claim Algeria in the African-American community. We've mm. never, claimed, it. We've never mm. claimed Algeria. Nobody has claimed Algeria since I've, I've, I've learned the word Africa. Oh, no. Mm. Well, anyway, let's move on to this question. When in African history do we see the first evidence of advanced mathematics? Now, Tom Ford, when you say advanced mathematics, what are we talking about? Are we talking about Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, differential equations, linear algebra, problem stats? Is that the advanced mathematics that you're speaking about, Tom Ford? Because the, the the highest I've seen would, would be uh, uh, geometry, you know, algebra, you know, like algebra, algebra one and two and geometry. So time forward, is, is that what you're talking about? When you say advanced mathematics, let me even look at 
what they consider. Let me see. Definition of advance. What are we talking about here? Because I didn't see any evidence of calculus. I didn't see any evidence of uh, calculus. Um, so when you say advanced math, it says usually refers to complex fields as trig. Uh, calculus or algebraic number theory. So yeah, I mean, they did have algebraic number theory <laughs> and we, you know, we know that they had geometry, which isn't trig, right? Um, trigonometry isn't, uh, yeah, you have algebra for trig. And uh, I always say that trig is like a combination of algebra and geometry, right? But it says that algebraic number theory. Okay, so algebra... Okay, so higher mathematics, according to dictionary.com, it said the advanced, the advanced portions of mathematics customarily considered as embracing all, oh, beyond arithmetic, geometry, algebra, and trig. So I, yeah, if we go by that definition, um, I haven't seen any evidence of, of calc, like calculus um, being used in, in, in Africa. I haven't seen it, but just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I've in, in, the, in the literature that I've read, um, I, I haven't seen evidence of like trig or uh, differential equations, linear algebra, or even problem stats. I haven't seen it in the literature. Sir, drop TV. What's up? All right. All right. Any more questions? Oh, he said algebra. He's talking. He said algebra and geometry. Well, yeah, there's evidence of algebra and geometry being used and uh, is seen in African history going back, um, you know, 2000 BCE, going all the way back there, Tom Ford. So if you're talking about algebra and geometry, absolutely. And I talked about that in my presentation. So um, I don't know if you came late. Yeah, but you, you just yeah, you need to go back and, and, and check that out. So if you're talking about algebra and geometry, our ancestors absolutely understood algebra and geometry. But when you mentioned higher, when I'm sorry, advanced mathematics, my mind went to calculus, uh, differential equations, linear algebra, and problem stats. And so I haven't seen that stuff um in you know in, in the literature, but uh definitely geometry and algebra. Go ahead, brother Garfield. Where, where do you see us as a community going? Because it seems like, we, um, you know, we, we complain about different religious groups and we bring African-centered thoughts and, you know, we, we, we become Kemetic, we get, you know, we, we get involved with Kemet and West Africa and all these African cultures. But it seems like we live in like, so, in some cases from one religion to a, a next religion. Where do you see us going? Because I, I, I'm looking at all the stuff. I did a video on cults the other day. And when I'm looking at Billy Carson or looking at um, Young Pharaoh or even Nature Boy, I, I don't know. I don't think we're coming back. I think we spooked out. We spooked <laughs> out. I mean, as Uncle would say, we spooked out. It's crazy. We love that stuff. We love hearing saying, if you drink the silver water or the gold water, you're going to live longer. We love that stuff. I'm telling you. We love it. We love. I'm telling you, in Jamaica, I had, this, I had a cousin. She was a nurse. And they told her she had a problem with her heart and she needed surgery. I swear to you, um, Dr. Mayat, the guy in Top Hill, I will never forget this in the country, said, listen, come by my house. I got this plant. If you boil... <laughs> Stop coffee. You. you come by, I'll boil some for you. And trust me, your heart going to be good. I'm, I'm, in Jamaica, they got, a, they, got, they got a plan for every damn thing. I'm telling you, we are spooked out. We hate science. We just hate it. What is? And I, I don't. I don't see the, the future for us. I don't know. Hey, brother Garfield, that's why I deal with the babies. You know, I, <laughs> I deal with the babies. You, you, you know, I may have conversations, truth to power talks, and talk to adults and post on Instagram. I, my focus is on the children, because, like you said, a lot of these, these, these folks, you know, especially the adults, they just spooked out, and I really think that's because of the Christian indoctrination you know, that, that molds us to be that way. And then when we even say that we moving away from Christianity, we still come to the conscious community spooked out. And so I think a, a huge part of that is, is due to religious and in, religious indoctrination. Um, but I'm dealing with the babies and that's why programs like conscious ingenuity is, ex, ex, is extremely important because we're building their character confidence and capabilities through steam. And so we're pushing STEM and, and teaching them to be scientifically literate people because see, scientifically literate people, Brother Garfield, wouldn't think that you just got a plant that you can give me 
that will fix, you know, my heart. Someone who's scientifically literate is going to be a person who operates with critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, analytical skills, right? They're higher order thinking skills. And so you're going to ask some questions like, what do you mean? Well, what's in the plant that would help my heart, brother? Oh, well, you know, so what are the properties of the plant? How is this going to help my heart? How is this? You start asking questions, right? And then you conclude that, no, this plant isn't going to help my heart, right? And so this program, Conscious Ingenuity, which we're going to be offering um, in the um, virtually uh, in June, and salute to Ghana. Ghana is going to be rolling it out. There's a few schools in Ghana uh, who will be meeting with virtually uh, starting in June and throughout, you know, the, the summer. But anyway, it's important that we raise a generation of people who are scientifically literate because, see, scientifically literate people will not fall a victim to people like the young pharaohs, the, the nature boys, the Bobby Hemmets, and all of those. I, I, if I say Phil Valentine, people are going to have a heart attack. So, you know, but people like that. OK, they go, how did you put Phil Valentine in there with young Pharaoh? Uh, I would throw some more of your teachers in there with young Pharaoh hey, as well. Hey, you never met Phil Valentine in your life. Never. Never met Phil Valentine. Didn't know he had the gathering of the masses in Brooklyn um, every three months or whatever. And he had all of them there. Bobby Hammett. The, he had, he's the one that introduced me to Bobby Hammett. Um, hold on. Let me scroll up and get this guy's question because he's like, Garfield, why can't you read my question? So let me find your question first, buddy. Um, are the math symbols universal? Are the math symbols universal? I don't know what he means by it. that's a question. I don't know. What is he saying? The plus sign, oh, the addition the symbol, sign, because it's used all over. Yeah. Oh, here it goes. The symbol zero to nine, who created them? And then he asks, are the math symbols universal? So let me put it on the, the board. There you go. That's what he asked first. Oh, I'm not sure. So he probably has me, and I'm not one to act like I know when I don't know. So I don't know. And I'm not going to act like I do know. It says the symbol zero through nine, who created or owned them? I, this not English. I have no idea. And I'm looking at Ricardo Robinson. He said, yeah, Doc, you wouldn't see calculus in Africa. It was invented by uh, Isaac Newton, a European, when he was in, the 20s, was in the 20s in England. Absolutely. So, you know, that makes perfect sense, um, Ricardo. Um, I need to get back to this guy's questions. Uh, hold on a second. All right. And after this, Brother uh, Garfield, I got to get ready to go. I have a, a one o'clock class I have to prepare for. All right. So, you know what? Let's, let's go, to your, go to your class then. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No, what was um, the last question? I want to get it in. Uh, what was the last Tiffany, question? Hold on. Let me get Miss Tiffany question in. Because she's going she gonna to text me and cuss me out. So, can we get that question in? Can you give three examples of African-centered thought? as it applies to black Americans, for example, how is, how is it applied? Three examples of African-centered thought as it applies. So Sister Tiffany, Miss Tiffany, are you, are you talking about like Africanisms? I just want to be clear before I answer your question. Ah, she said, no, I'm not, LOL. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. So African-centered thought as it applies to us, so when I think of, you know, Africans in a thought, oh my goodness, your question, I'm trying to figure out like what you, what you mean by that, right? Like, are you saying um, how we operate, you know, as a family, our, um, our views, our morals, our values? Yeah, I, I would think, I would think in, I would say just by hearing that question, like, mm -hmm. how would we, as you know, like in African systems, we have like a rites of passage for the sisters. So she's possibly talking about how would you look at, growing up a child you right from africans so that's the way i would see it i mean sister tiffany you could tell us if, if yeah tell wrong. us in the chat sister tiffany because i just want to make sure i answer your question zane montigo tell me the question real quick go ahead go ahead bro i'm gonna make sure i answer her question i want to make sure i understand it so i can order it she said that was for garfield but yes people keep saying we should live from an african-centered thought process so what does that mean? Oh, I talked about that earlier, Miss Tiffany. I talked, yeah, because, I talked because, about that earlier, literally at the beginning of the uh, discussion. That was his first question. That's guess, the first I thing guess, he asked me. Yeah, I guess looking at it from an African perspective, how we dealt with it from our perspective, instead of looking at it from a Eurocentric perspective. It's just like yeah. how people deal with birthdays. You might deal with birthdays different than how somebody in Africa deal with birthdays. That's a yeah. Our whole, you know, our our holy days. People say holidays. Our holy days. 
um, our ideas about male female relationships, gender roles, uh, how we like you said how we raise how we rear our children, the values that we operate with, the morals we operate with, um, how we view the world, um, our purpose, you know, our overall culture. Dang, Miss Tiffany, it's a lot. <laughs> it's yeah, a it's lot. lot. It's a lot. Um, Jay Montego, tell me your question real quickly so that I could ask her. Who is it, um, Brother Garfield? Zane Montego. I'm waiting for his question. Zane Montego, come on, come on, bro. You say you got it right question. there. I see it. What is to be said about the individual who say we do not use most of the math taught in schools anyhow? Oh, so like, is it is it relevant for us to use the math that we are taught in school? It depends. It depends. I mean, for school, it's it's always basic. In the Caribbean, we grew up in a Eurocentric world, teaching where England was the one that gave us the work. And we had to learn math and English was essential. And it's the same thing here, math, English, and science. Yeah, it is essential. So I, would, I don't even understand why someone would say, well, we don't use it. You know, we don't. And I would also say it depends on what you do for a living. If you're in STEM, you're going to use it. If you're in STEM, you're definitely going to use it. But we well, use basic math when you go to the when you Dr. go to the market. You know, when you have to do it on the corner in the pharmaceutical industry, math is important. Absolutely. <laughs> important. And he'll tell you, yes. Was English important? Yes. Was science Absolutely. important? Yes. That answer your question. All right, I'm gonna leave it there. Dr. Maya, thank you for coming on. No I problem, think, brother. Again, I think you're top five dead or alive in the community. <laughs> yeah. You're top five dead or alive, sis. But we're gonna talk about that England trip when you're going, because I might want to go. I'm going again summer. I'm going for a week though. I'm not going for long. I'm going you going where, where you say you're going? Yeah, I'm going back to UK for another week. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm, I, like I said, Brother Garfield, hit me up and let me know when you're going so we can coordinate something because I'll roll out in a heartbeat. All right, cool. All right, All right hey, family. Whether y'all like Garfield or not, you gotta appreciate I'm bringing on the guests. I had Doctor Sheikh Ante Babu on. Um, he's from Senegal. He knew um Sheikh Ante Diop. He was on Monday. I had um Doctor what's her name Francesca Stavrakopoulou on yesterday. She's a Hebrew doctor. Um, Fra uh, Francesca is a um expert in Hebrew Bible, and then now I got Doctor Mayat, who's just an expert in every damn thing. No, I'm not. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> Shepherd said, I'm going to Egypt. Go ahead and make sure you change your name too while you're at it. Uh, all right, Brother Garfield, I'm going to run. Peace and love to you and peace and love to the listening audience. All right. Peace and love, family. All right, family, I'm out of here. This is Brother Garfield again. Another beautiful show. I've got to go back and listen and take my notes and do what we do. All right. Peace and love. If y'all want to argue about something else, I'll go live like three o'clock. Y'all could argue about any foolishness y'all want to argue about. All right. Peace and love, family. We out. Subscribe.